Hello, everybody. Uh, we are very pleased today uh, to have an exceptional speaker for this European AI Week. Mark Kuckelberg will present today uh, his new book, The Political Philosophy of AI, and uh, I will be the moderator for this session of today. My name is Karl Merck, and I co-direct FARI, the AI for the Common Good Institute here in Brussels, um, to give you a bit of a forward on who Mark is. So I can only say about the professional side. So he's a professor of philosophy at uh, the University of Vienna, specialized in media and technology. Uh, he's the vice dean of the Faculty of Philosophy and Education. He's a former president of the Society for Philosophy and Technology, and he's a member of the European Commission high-level expert group. And the list goes on, so I selected only some of his uh, most prominent lines. He's an expert, renowned experts in the world on ethics and technology, and in particular on robotics and artificial intelligence. The goal of today is to present his new book, The Political Philosophy of AI. So in his own words, uh, it's the first accessible introduction to the political challenges related to AI. It's a, a book that I think will have a significant importance for us in the field of AI, because it highlights some of the dynamics, some of the challenges that are sometimes maybe not seen as priority or that are maybe seen as maybe issues that are related to social challenges at large, but that we don't see as maybe key pressing central issues for AI. The goal is really to see how can political philosophy be used to better understand AI and all its challenges. Uh, the goal of today is also to see a little bit through his book uh, presentation, how to explore key debates to deal with the challenges of artificial intelligence and in his own word as well, artificial power. So Mark, I'm very happy uh, to also show one review of your book that you had selected that I found very interesting. So Kate Crawford, who also uh, wrote recently on how AI and power are intrinsically connected. She said that artificial intelligence is fundamentally political and this book illuminates why. It spans the debates about inequality, democracy, power, and post-humanism, and shows the importance of social and political theory to understanding AI. One thing that is excellent in uh, Mark's book is definitely the ability of putting in simple words, very complex notions, and introducing to a field of political philosophy and how it connects to AI ethics. So it's a, really an important book. And I will start and finish on that as well. Uh, one of the first quotes of Mark in his book is, I guess the computer got it wrong. And I guess the computer got it wrong is a quote of a police officer saying after a mistake of an AI system, uh, just a simple sentence. And I think it shows that something that could, was just a simple sentence can have also a big impact on someone's life and it's all connected to AI. And I let you, Mark, introduce and present your book for 30 minutes. We will then have maybe one question and then two guiding questions of my part. And then we will let the audience as well uh, ask questions. So if you have any comments for the audience, please write them in the YouTube chat or on the Zoom chat. Uh, they will be relayed to us. Thank you very much. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to speak at this event, uh, an important event about AI in Europe. And um, I am, of course, uh, also honored to present my book here, The Political Philosophy of AI. Let me share my uh, slides. Um, maybe this should... And then, now I think you can see my slides. Um, so yeah, um, Carl already gave an example of uh, how AI impacts politics. Um, and uh, so for, for me, it was, uh, I, I saw a lot of AI ethics, and of course I contribute myself also to AI ethics work. Um, but I missed a little bit of political dim dimension in a more systematic way. And, and to do this, I decided to use political philosophy. And so if you look at uh, chapters in the book, you'll see that various um, key political values, political principles are used in the book to structure the, the discussion, um, including freedom, justice, democracy, power, 
um, non-humans and environment. And then I um, added my kind of conclusion, uh, what I see as, as a future of this um, subfield. Um, computers can get it wrong. Uh, you just uh, heard already the example that I give in the book. Um, I think it's a very good example. It's, of course, an example drawn from the American context. Um, but uh, in, in Europe here, we have our own biases. And uh, so it's very relevant here too. And it shows especially that yeah, the, the, there are systemic injustices, systemic biases, and that AI can uh, promote such biases, uh, prolong them, and um, make it more difficult to, to get rid of them. And this is just one example of how um, AI can, can have a political impact. So what I do with political philosophy then is to, to try to better understand these normative issues. Um, but in a way, as a philosopher of technology, then um, I have two hats here. Um, I, I, I try to show how they are entangled with um, uh, new technologies. And here it's AI. AI that is not neutral, um, but is political true and true. Um, and so this is a follow-up of work on AI ethics, but really taking it into that political direction. Um, in the beginning of the book, of course, um, it, it's mandatory to say something about artificial intelligence. Uh, just like in AI ethics, I um, say like, well, AI is not this kind of science fiction thing. Uh, there's no such thing as a general AI. Um, it's, it's, it's everywhere, it's already there. Um, but it's not human-like, um, for example, in, in the household, um, uh, but also at work and at various places. Um, so for AI, I think uh, we can take technical definitions, um, but it's also important to see how in, in our society there are certain narratives, certain images, and in, in a political context, these images are also used for political purposes. Um, also, AI is not this thing, but is a, is a process, is, is in the first place a technical process um, within data science. And um, I think it's good to, to look at these different facets of AI. But in the book, um, in, in this book, I, I really focus on, on the politics. And um, so the first principle, political principle that's, um, that's important in our liberal democracies in, in, in Europe is freedom. And um, I find it interesting to see how exactly AI circumvents human autonomy. It's also a theme that I touched upon already in my book, Green Leviathan, um, that came out last year. Um, but here I, I embed it in this bigger project and also uh, further develop it. Um, so if we, if we see in our uh, society and, and legal frameworks, um, of course, we all subscribe to freedom. The question is if in practice this also happens in a global context, for example, there is still slavery. Um, and also uh, with, within Europe, there is more and more um, infringements upon the freedom of people, um, in, especially in countries where uh, the rule of law is no longer respected. So it's important to look at this and um, uh, then look at AI and see what AI, um, how AI impacts that freedom. So in political philosophy, we have this notion of, um, of negative freedom, um, meaning freedom from interference. So someone tries to uh, limit your freedom from outside, uh, but there's also autonomy um, um, in, inside of you, so to speak, uh, whether you can govern yourself. Um, your desires, your, your life. And um, I think AI impacts on, on both kinds of freedom. It impacts on negative freedom because it, through the predictive policing, uh, through surveillance technologies, it um, can lead to, to uh, restrictions on liberty. Um, and also uh, in, in, inside of us, the, the governance of ourselves, I think it also impacts there. Um, for example, when it helps to influence and manipulate our choices. And I compare this in the book with nudging. 
Um, nudging is, is trying to influence people, for example, what to buy in a supermarket by placing it in a different place. And in this way, um, subconsciously influencing people. Well, AI can also be used to, uh, for that. AI is often used in uh, combination with behavioral economics, um, positive psychology to uh, make us buy things, make uh, steer our behavior. And uh, this violates um, not so much negative freedom because no one restricts us, but it, it does violate the, the, the management of ourselves and um, our desires, what we want. Um, so in these subtle ways, I think um, AI can, can influence us. Um, and I think the biggest risk with regards to autonomy is that we um, risk to treat people as objects, right? Objects that can be manipulated and um, just like, like machines. Then equality and justice are uh, two further important principles. Here, the topic of bias was already touched upon in the, in the example. What I noticed in uh, the discussions about um, AI ethics, also in policy, is that political philosophy was not really used to discuss a really important question, namely, wh what is then uh, bias and, and what is fairness, what is justice? And so if we say that something is, is biased and that it's not good, then I think we need to justify that and say why, why it is the case. And then political philosophy can really help. Um, for example, when we have a problem like um, bias in face recognition with skin color, um, political philosophy can help us to justify why this is wrong. Um, or, for example, the, the case uh, the, with the Compass algorithm in the US where there were um, uh, people who, who um, with a different skin color than white, um, had a comparatively higher risk. Um, it's more complicated, but uh, let's not go into that in detail. But, but the, the point is that the algorithm uh, on the basis of skin color um, gave a different result than, than it should have been. But this should is important, right? So why is it wrong? Um, also, credit scoring their problems. So, why is it wrong? Well, we can we can look at the um, um, principles and uh, political philosophy is specialized in in um, unpacking these principles. What is fairness? Uh, for example, from a Marxist per perspective, one looks at different uh, social relations and um, relations of production. Um, but there are also different views on, on bias, uh, more universalist views, which say that uh, basically bias is wrong because we should treat everyone equally, and other views more based on identity, which say we should prioritize people who, um, on the basis of their um, identity, are uh, discriminated. So there are all these different uh, theories, and you will see in the book in detail, I go through them. I think it can help us to um, to think about why bias is wrong or which kinds of bias are uh, wrong. Um, democracy is for me now currently a very important team. I'm working on that. Um, what does it mean to have AI um, impacting democracy? Um, I, here too, there, there, there is a lot of public discussion about this already, um, but very little research. and. I think in, in philosophy, we need to ask always about the concept. So what do we mean here by democracy? Um, I think that question has to be answered. And the truth is that we are not sure about that. Um, we say that we have democracies, but we are not really happy with them. Um, but we don't really know what, what is the best ideal of democracy. And so philosophers can discuss about this. Um, there are, um, um, for example, ideas about direct um, democracy and their technologies such as say I could help. But there's also the, the problem that um, authoritarian tendencies can be um, supported. And um, I find it important to say authoritarian here because although our countries also already use, uh, countries that call themselves democracies in Europe already use surveillance technologies and so on. I think there, there's a tendency because of the technology to really um, have, have total control because total surveillance is possible. Um, and um, this is increasingly problematic 
especially uh, because it in the end um, really impacts uh, our, our core ideas we have here uh, in, in Europe and in the West, which uh, have ideas such as, uh, you know, we know better our own thoughts and what we want. Um, but yeah, totalitarianism armed with AI could, could change that dramatically and say that, that they know better what we want. Um, so Big Brother is there, Big Other also, like um, and there are different actors, I think. There's, there's the state, but there are also big companies. There, there are also uh, peers uh, who, who surveil, uh, can do surveillance, just other people like you and me. So they're, 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 we have to look and inquire into these new forms of totalitarianism. Um, I find it very helpful uh, with regard to totalitarianism to, um, to read Hannah Arendt again, um, who talks about the conditions for totalitarianism. Um, one of them being a social one, the loneliness and isolation we have in modern societies, um, but also a lack of trust. And um, I think that when we have already this phenomena, and to the extent that we have this phenomena today, then AI, um, it, it's not that AI causes things, but AI makes things worse. And um, I think, it, especially her concept of the banality of evil, I found here useful. Um, because the bureaucratic management of people and uh, the management of people by corporations um, using um, tools of positivistic psychology um, and AI, I think that all these combinations of AI and um, existing practices, existing management practices, I think are, um, you know, could lead to what Arendt calls the banality of evil, that evil is done not because it's necessarily always intended, but because um, it, it's already um, ingrained in our institutions and in our ways of working, where we treat people like um, things. Um, again, so think again about what I said about freedom. Um, so it, it, AI, you know, has, has a lot of new opportunities, but also enables these um, anti-democratic um, uh, tendencies. Um, in a chapter on power, I further talk about that. Um, giving for the, the, the example of uh, the Panopticon prison, which is used also by, by Michel Foucault, um, to, to, to say like, well, we, we live actually today in, um, in a kind of Panopticon, meaning that um, we don't know if someone sees us, but, but um, someone can see what we do, right? So we, we, we feel basically under surveillance, uh, for example, when we're on social media, but we don't know who is watching. And this is a particular way of exercising power over people. Um, it's also a way that employers can increasingly use, um, think about Uber, uh, who already uses AI for surveillance of workers. And if, if workers don't you know, do it like they want, they can get fired. Um, I think this way of, of, of doing, uh, you know, of, of treating people uh, can become more common. Um, so more opportunities for disciplining are presented by AI, but also quantification uh, that we do ourselves. So we treat ourselves also more and more as things, um, as things that can be uh, monitored, quantified, um, and, and disciplined. Uh, for example, when we discipline ourselves as, as citizens, when we go running, for example, or when we try to um, eat more healthy. Um, in in a, a forthcoming book on self-improvement, where I'm very critical about self-improvement, I um, criticize not so much self-improvement as such, but, but this um, quantification, for example, and other ways in which we uh, become obsessed with improving ourselves. And AI will also play a, a, an increasing role there um, in, in uh, disciplining ourselves. And the question is if we want to go more in, in that direction or not. Um, that doesn't mean that AI itself is the problem, right? So as I said, there are these institutions, there are these ingrained ways of doing things, and um, there are especially human beings. So we still have a way to resist. We have also a way to change our technologies because humans are always part of that. Um, in, the, in my book on, on performance, uh, Moved by Machines, it's called, I talk more about 
um, how to understand technologies and humans and the relations between the two in terms of performance, uh, a performance where, where humans are also part of. So there is still a, a way to get out of this. This is not a totally pessimistic book, um, but, but it's important, I think, to see the dangers and, and see that also it's not always the, the, the others or or the government or uh, big companies that we have to be afraid of. It's also ourselves when we um, try to improve ourselves, for example, when we try to live, lead our lives on an everyday basis um, and use AI um, for that purpose. Um, that's why I speak about artificial power, right? Artificial intelligence is power. Um, and uh, so what, you know, could be concluded from this is like, well, we need um, AI that is uh, that is more ethical, but also politically uh, better uh, for us. That um, yeah, in a way, is is powerful, but in a, in a better way. Um, at the end of the book, do I say like, well, just as with AI ethics, um, there's always this stress on human-centered AI. Um, I think the, the, you know, to do politics of AI should not only be a question of making sure the human comes back into the picture and humans are not only treated as, uh, not, not treated as things. I think it's also important to um, uh, look at humans in a, in a wider context, in an environmental context, in a climate context, and, and also see that there are other beings on this planet, uh, not just humans. So um, here uh, I, I borrow from political philosophy and post-humanism um, also the, the idea that um, humans are not necessarily the uh, only political subjects. Um, maybe animals can also be given a, a political status or some animals. And uh, for AI, I think that means that, yeah, we, we need to, um, to think about, about what the impact of AI is on the environment, on um, other beings and, and on the planet. Um, I think it's important to, yeah, to have an, an ethics that's not merely anthropocentric. Um, so post-humanism is very inspiring there, environmental ethics, also environmental uh, politics here in this book. Um, for example, Haraway talks about companion species and, and different ways of thinking. Um, about the world, uh, ways that are not so anthropocentric. I think that's very inspiring. Um, and in environmental politics, there is already for a long time also uh, all kinds of uh, concepts around. So I think we can use that um, in uh, politics of AI to make sure that um, human interests are not the only ones that, that count. Um, how exactly to balance human interests and um, and, and non-human interest is, is, of course, a challenge. Uh, but again, in political philosophy, we, we find discussions about that. Um, once we, we leave this human exceptionalist and, and anthropocentric position, uh, we can then further think like, OK, what does it mean, for example, uh, if, uh, if, if, our, our, if, if our pets count, right? Uh, um, but there is a situation in which we have to choose between humans and, and pets, what do we do and so on. So that it's not so, um, not so easy. On, on a global scale also, there's um, an, another dimension to this because there are also um, different humans, different cultures, different ways of treating animals. Um, so this is quite challenging, but I think it's, it's a challenge that we cannot avoid in the 21st century, that we should not avoid today. Um, and uh, just like in, in um, philosophy of technology in general, I, I, I uh, defend relational and open ontologies um, for thinking about this, um, thinking about the world as, as, um, as relational and thinking about humans also as relational. Um, because even if you uh, say that humans are the most important, humans are very much connected to other beings and uh, to the planet. So, um, if we, if we don't take care of um, non-humans and of the planet, then we have a problem uh, ourselves anyway. So um, even in a, in a mildly anthropocentric politics, I think it's important to think about that. So for AI, it means like, yeah, we, we, we need to, to think what could be the consequences for, um, for people and planets. Um, 
I, I've been working on that also uh, already in the high level expert group for European Commission. And um, I, uh, I continue to think about this, especially the, the relation with climate. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it can lead to questions, for example, um, like what kind of um, energy use does a particular use of AI incur? And, and can, we, um, can we have less energy use? Also, of course, the, the opportunities AI um, gives us to, um, to better monitor energy use and to, to save energy. So there, there are various sides there um, of this, this, this problem. Um, to conclude this presentation and to also um, uh, note some things from the conclusion then, um, I do think it's, it's really uh, good to look at these very traditional topics and less traditional topics such as non-humans um, in the light of AI. Um, so the good thing is that um, thinking about AI in this way uh, helps us uh, to, to think about AI, but also uh, I think in the end helps us to think about what does freedom, justice, democracy um, mean today uh, in the 21st century um, in, in the context of these new technologies um, like AI. Um, I think these, are, these questions will come up uh, increasingly, will also continue to dominate politics. Um, uh, we think that politics is not so much about technology, but it will increasingly be about technology. And um, so it's, it's very important, I think, to um, both at national and European level to, um, to give more attention to it. And you see it already also politically, how, how, how this is starting to shift, how, how more resources and people are working on this. Um, so ahead of us, then I think we need um, European, but also global approaches. And we need what I call in the political technologies that can help us to create better positive stories in the future. And with political technologies, I mean that, yeah, it's the technologies, but it's the technologies that are also connected to procedures, to institutions. Uh, we need to think about how to reform our current democratic institutions in a way that um, enables us to effectively manage technologies um, but also use them in a positive way towards goals, uh, goals of development, goals of um, environmental well-being, and um, yeah, goals that have to do with with um, with human beings, of course. Um, so that's it. Um, I mentioned already AI ethics also in green Vietnam, but this is now a focus on uh, and a more systematic treatment of the political philosophy of AI. Um, I hope you, um, you got something out of this presentation and there's of course much more in the book and I'm looking forward to, to your questions, Carl. All right. Thank you very much, Mark, for your presentation. Uh, it was very enlightening. So I will propose to take one question that I think complement the conclusions of your book. Then I will have one guiding question and then switch back to questions of the audience. We already have some very engaged members of the audience. So a question from Sue Anne. Thanks for the presentation, Mark. I wonder how far you think the contemporary human rights framework can carry the load of addressing the political challenges you mentioned here. For example, autonomy concerns are addressed through an expansive view of the rights to privacy. So what are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that that uh, human rights framework can already do, do some work. Uh, for example, these questions around freedom uh, can partly be addressed by it, and, um, and the privacy is one example of it. And what I think the human rights framework is less good in is um, to deal with more systemic institutional and structural issues that have to do with the way we organize our society. So um, the rights are formulated at individual level, and that often you know, leads to people not considering this, this wider structure. So we have to look, for example, at fairness um, also at a, at a macro level. Um, however, I think they, you know, they're one of the tools that we have. And if, if pragmatically they are instrumental also at the global level to, to um, you know, get some things done in terms of politics of AI and, and wider, uh, I, I think it's great. Um, another problem with human rights is that, um, that in a global context, um, 
that it's sometimes seen as a Western concept. So there's that discussion that we need to have. Um, I do think that universal principles have a role to play as long as we are very aware where they come from and what could be their limitations. Um, but yeah, so I, I think they definitely have a role to play. Thank you very much. So I had a rather personal question as well. It's uh, because your introduction directly refers to Kafka mm -hmm. and his view on totalitarianism. A situation occurs, nobody can explain it while still having a direct consequence and uh, seeming completely arbitrary. It seems that throughout your work, uh, and I've seen it in uh, some other texts that you've written, uh, where other researchers would maybe say surveillance or social challenge, you really directly say totalitarian. Ex example, I remember one of your texts about robots. You often quote Foucault and you showed the panopticon, so it's no surprise, but I was wondering, and that's the personal part, if it has a special resonance to you and why you would make maybe a choice uh, of using the word totalitarian, because that roots it into political philosophy. But I was curious to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks for the question. Yeah, uh, the personal part, I have a long-standing interest in, in, um, in totalitarianism and its origins and conditions already. Before I studied philosophy, I studied political science and, and, and focused my, um, um, my, my bachelor work on, um, you know, the, origins of, of totalitarianism, reading Har Hannah Arendt, but also other people who after the war, questions like, how is this, you know, how was this possible? And um, so I see it as a, as a, a big danger. And as I, I started writing about it again, the last years, because uh, I see it, um, I, I saw in, in, in US tendencies towards it. And um, also in, in, in Europe, uh, during, during the last years, and um, uh, especially Central and Eastern Europe, and, and so I, I was worried about that, and uh, and then the pandemic came, and, and I saw, um, you know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm uh, very much in favor of of uh, the measures that were taken, uh, most of the measures, but but uh, there was also an atmosphere where where suddenly the um, yeah the state took a bigger role, and and. Um, and some measures can, I think, be questions, for example, the, um, like the curfew, uh, that people were not allowed to go on the street after a certain time. Um, and, and that suddenly gave a really, it gave me a really strange feeling. Yeah? And I think I'm not alone. So I, I think we, we have to really watch out with our democracies because they're very vulnerable and, and they can easily glide into uh, some other forms. Um, so I, I'm, I'm afraid of that, and I'm, uh, I think um, by painting this, this more uh, um, bleak feature, uh, picture of, of, of you know, totalitarianism with AI, I think we, we have some, some kind of um, thing to compare us to, um, and, and often knowing where you don't want to go helps to, to then uh, define a space in which to define positive goals, like where, you know, what do we want to do with it? our society, how do we want to order society? Thank you very much for your very in-depth uh, answer. We have a question also about the possible solutions that you said. Uh, you're not uh, fully pessimistic. You also see that there are probably things that need to be done. Um, and someone asks, what do you propose as measure of non-human justice? How are we supposed to know what non-human entities see as justice? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great question and, and an important problem, right? Because, um, I mean, the, the philosopher Thomas Nagel wrote, wrote this, uh, um, asked this question, uh, uh, what is it like to be a bat? And um, the, the, the truth is that we don't really know uh, exactly the subjective experience of, um, of um, uh, animals. And um, so th this is really a, 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 an issue. Um, of course, we can, uh, by comparing to ourselves, by using the signs that we have, um, we, we can figure out what their needs are, right? And, and on that basis, um, try to take into account their interests. So I think it's, it's partly the use of empathy and, and comparison with, with us and partly the scientific work on it, but also the science will will have to evolve and is already evolving. If we see, for example, how now the, the uh, the life and, and mind of octopus, if, you know, we, we get to know much more about it. 
Um, I, I think there's a lot of evolution there and we're only at the beginning of this. Uh, we have long neglected uh, this question and for too long. So um, I, I think we're, we're on a path there um, and uh, philosophers can also help with that. Thank you, Mark. Um, we have a, a brilliant question as well from uh, Mark Wright, and it's a, a rather long one. So um, this is brilliant, Mark, and I do have some questions that I will split out. First, to what extent do you see the emergence of the philosophy of technology and increasingly AI as an extension of the works of Heidegger, Jaspers, Arendt, Elul? Second, I find it's easy to demonize technology as part of my research and analyzing the advent of nihilism against the backdrop of the exponential growth of technology. Jaspers tells us how modern humanity currently lives in the present, cut adrift from the past and has lost control of this destiny in a technologically determined world. How far away are your thoughts from this? Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question. Yes, I, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's an understandable question because in philosophy of technology, there has been this tradition of demonizing technology. And um, I think what I'm doing should be understood differently. So um, I, I don't demonize technology and I do think that technology development can be uh, directed in positive ways to you know, reach um, uh, good political goals. I, I do think, however, that there are some tendencies in the technologies that need to be studied. And what I learned from Heidegger, for example, is that there is this non intended influence of technologies and the technology is not just this thing but it's also like kind of embedded in our culture and our ways of doing things and i've developed that further also with wittgenstein in in works and things using words and things but um yeah so um, the reason why i now um maybe sound a bit more negative is that um that of course i find myself um in in this world where um, where there's a, a lot of tech people and policy people pushing for technology and seeing it mainly as positive. And, um, and there's kind of this, this ideology from Musk and others in, in California um, and increasingly Texas uh, to, you know, to, to this kind of solution and techno solutionism that technology can be used to solve our, all our problems. And so what I'm doing is also pushing back uh, against that, um, so so I, I try to have a, a, a reasonable middle position uh, there. But um, yeah, the, in, maybe in, in my presentation now I stressed a little bit the, more the negative sides um, because there is so much of that kind of uh, thinking um, ar around us in the in the tech world. Thank you very much. Um, I will then follow up with a, a question of mine that I had for you as well. So you call in the last chapters of your book for a non-anthropocentric politics of AI. So few declarations in AI ethics, in my view, had this scope and integrated uh, other elements than humans. Um, it was fairly human-centric uh, for the most part. And some talked about sentient beings, uh, some talked about also environmental considerations, but it was really, I would say, a minority. So given the rise of the sustainable development goals, we can see that other frameworks, a little bit like uh, other frameworks exist, like the human rights that was mentioned before, we know that uh, AI ethics is not completely self-sufficient and you need to complement it. Um, and going back to the sustainable development goals, do you think we're going in the right direction to have a more non-anthropocentric politics of AI? Mm -hmm. Well, I think among, um, among researchers in academia, among artists and so on, I, I, I think there's more and more, um, uh, and of course also at Fari, for example, right? There's more and more awareness of this. And, and uh, so I think we're moving in the right direction when it comes to, to thinking. Um, we're not really moving in the right direction when it comes to political action. I think there is a lot to do still. Uh, there, um, as far as I see, um, I, I, I looked at the goal some time and, and saw what has been reached. And it, it's really deplorable how little has been reached from the sustainable development goals in general. Um, so for, for AI, I think that means that we need a lot more effort in that direction, right? Uh, and so in, in, I think policymakers uh, should be aware of that. And, and not only about using AI to reach the goals, but also seeing the, the sides of AI that could hinder the goals 
and then try to to stimulate as policymakers, um, you know, the, the development of AI in 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 a in a way that um, that does not have these problems. Um, I think that's that's important. Um, and of course, this should be seen in a wider picture. It's not just AI, right? AI should not be demonized, of course, right? So it's not it's not AI that is the evil of the of the world now. Uh, it's more one of the one of the factors that, um, yeah, that that unfortunately often contributes to um, us going not in the in the way of the of these goals and um, and and staying in the old patterns. Um, but I but I see there is there is movement and. And also politically, there there are some signs of hope. Also, right, and uh, there are many people in the younger generations that are very aware of it, that protests and so on. And uh, I think slowly in politics, there's also, um, yeah, a, a movement towards towards this. Um, so I think AI, the discussion about AI, should also be seen in that context, and maybe can contribute uh, to that kind of uh, developments. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Eugenio. Um, how do you see the prospects for an international governance of AI in the light of current political developments globally? Would countries be able to come to an agreement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, there's a normative question and a factual question. Uh, normative, I'm a big uh, fan of um, um, a global approach and, and global governance of global issues. I think if you have global issues, you have to also, next to other levels, you need um, supranational global governance, and I argued this for the pandemic, for example, but it's also true for AI, and it's true for for um, many problems that we have currently, um, also including climate and environment. So um, I'm very much in favor uh, of that, um, and I will continue as an academic to work uh, on, on that to to argue for it. Um, the, the the problem is that the the reality is very different. That there are a lot of tendencies today. They go exactly towards the opposite. Um, uh, there was Trump's America, and there's uh, there's this war. There's um, uh, all kind of um, yeah more uh, yeah directions that 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 um, make people fold upon themselves because people feel insecure uh, in this world, which is very understandable. And, and then uh, yeah, unfortunately, we translate that in in a kind of um, uh, folding back in the form of nationalism and uh, and its its consequences. So um, I think factually, uh, empirically, we, we really have a problem there. Um, but if we look at how after the Second World War, how um, you know the, how this also very disruptive event, um, how this sparked also an internationalism and more global approaches um, led to the to United Nations and. and and of course, Europe itself, EU, uh, um, and, and other international institutions. I, I think um, we, we can maybe learn from that example and say, like, okay, we have all these crises and we have this feeling that the world is insecure, not a good place, but let's do something about that at, at various levels. And I think the global level is one of them. Thank you. Um, I had uh, another question from my part because you say that. Uh, different places that AI is political. You even, to quote, you say AI is political through and through. Kate Crawford also that we quoted before said also that AI is politics. Um, and I think your work definitely echoes what Gilbert Simondon has been saying about mm -hmm. techniques or technologies that it's not neutral. Uh, there is the process of invention, the tool itself and the relations behind it. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you think that people don't see enough that AI is political or do not put forward the fact that there are political elements in it? Uh, was it one of the motivations for your book as well to try to push a little bit more for this vision? Yes, absolutely. So um, I, I continued what I also did in Introduction to Philosophy of Technology, the book for, for OUP. Uh, I, I um, um, already tried to give this message like that the technology is not neutral. Um, I see recently uh, also people pick up this idea much more. There's a book of this title and so on. Um, and, and, and I think it's really good. And I think for politics, it's also important to do that. And I, I follow Simon Don also in, in trying to bring technology and, and human culture together, including politics, right? So that, that technology is not just this thing. 
And what's also great in Simon Don is the, the, the perspective of, of uh, evolution and change and process. Uh, I think we need more process thinking. Um, AI is not this thing, but it's part of a larger pro process, a process that's also social, cultural, and political. Um, and if we understand that, I think we, we, um, we take technology more seriously as something that, that requires our political attention. Um, so th this is also for me, it's a, it's a message towards academics um, who don't see this, this non-instrumental uh, role of technology yet, but, but, but it's also a, a message towards policymakers and citizens to say like, okay, uh, this, this should get more attention. Um, AI and other digital technologies are really um, already uh, dominating our, our daily life and, and are really uh, shaping our society, our culture and our, our politics. Um, and so once we get aware of that, the, the idea is not that we are fatalists and say, oh, we cannot do anything more, the machine is taking over, but rather that we say like, okay, let's try to steer this, let's try to, to, to move this in a, in a good direction, a direction that we want, um, direction that we see uh, as, as good, uh, that works towards a common good. Thank you. And uh, so you have a beautiful problem. You're being grilled on the chat by many people asking very relevant questions. So for instance, Yana is asking, if humans give AI its power, what would, what would our actions be, the people? How could they uh, complement uh, and implement to take power back? Is responsibility shared to which parts, government, state, firms, the people, individuals? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question, um, and I'm very grateful for, for all the questions. I think the, the, um, when we think about it in terms of responsibility, um, for me, responsibility is definitely a distributed thing. Uh, if we really think about the world as this relational whole, right, from, starting from this relational ontology, we also have to, to, take, uh, to draw the consequences, and the consequences is that that uh, we are all to some extent responsible for things, and so it means that uh, also citizens can do something. And um, if it comes to totalitarian tendencies, for example, I think then uh, resistance is the answer. Uh, for other things, it can be a different answer. It could be participation in democratic processes in changing politics rather than turning away from it. Um, so I, I, I think there's, there's a lot that different people can do with regard to animals and non-humans. Um, we have to be the spokespersons of um, those animals who don't speak our language, but they speak different languages. We can try to understand them better and, um, and try to defend their, their interests as much as we can and as much as we can understand them. Um, but taking into account the limitations of that, so being a bit careful maybe about, um, about such claims, but, but still I think uh, we have to do that just as we also have to speak for very young children uh, and take responsibility for people who, who for some medical reason cannot, um, uh, you know, don't have all the, the, the cognitive capacities anymore that uh, most of us have. So I, I think we, um, we have to do it in that way then. Um, it, it's always, I think it's always good to, with responsibility to err on the side of taking too much responsibility rather than too little. Um, I think that's, that's, that's a good lesson for humans as individuals, but also for organizations like companies uh, or for, um, for political responsible people. Thank you. Um, to all the attendees, we will have time for, uh, I think, two more questions. So there are questions in the chat. I will give uh, all attendees a bit more time to ask the final questions as well. Um, I wanted to also... Uh, ask you another question to follow up on the idea that you mentioned of the lack of trust. Mm -hmm. um, how to possibly come out? Because you mentioned uh, as sol potential solutions, uh, the political technologies. Um, can you give us an example of what these political technologies could look like and how and by whom should they be used and developed? Mm -hmm. Okay. How it could look like, for example, if we think that democracy is not only about voting once in a while, but is also uh, something that requires the participation of citizens in actually making of the policies rather than only representation. 
then uh, of course uh, digital technologies can can uh, play a role there and um, it's not so easy to see what exactly how it would look like um, but but that is something we can think about and ai and data science can play a role there by by offering us information which we didn't have before um, but we really need i think a combination there of citizens and experts to to figure out together what does this uh, often statistical information that we get from the, the forms of AI that we have today that, you know, what does it mean, uh, how to interpret and what, what, what does it then imply for, for policy in a particular area, like, for example, if you have more data and uh, good analysis of environmental and climate data, but there, there's, there's still something to be bridged there. And so if we could have political technologies in the sense of um, um, a use of AI there that, that already helps us to, to better interpret, that is more transparent, um, a use of AI that, that supports a participative way of doing things rather than centralist decision making, um, that, that could be a way. So it's a combination of technology and institutional change that I'm looking at. Thank you very much. Um, we then have a question from one of your fellow philosophers. Uh, how much influence has Andrew Finberg uh, on your work, in particular, the looseness around the calling for democratization or technology, mm -hmm. of technology? Yeah, what, what, what I like about uh, Finberg's work is the critical perspective, of course, and his combination of some Heideggerian influences on the one hand, right, phenomenology, but through Marcuse then, uh, taking it to, to a critical level and having this uh, this defense of democracy. Um, so I think Fimer is someone who's already for a long time interested in how to do um, uh, philosophy of technology in this kind of political way, thinking about what could be democracy with technology, uh, how, how could we have democratic technologies. Uh, so that remains very relevant. Um, uh, and you know, when I was president of the Society for uh, Philosophy of Technology, I, I, I was happy to honor him with a prize at that moment also for, for that kind of work. And there, of course, in the meantime, also many other people that started working on the politics of technology. And um, in the generation of Finberg, there's also Langdon Wiener, for example, is very interesting. Um, so yeah, I think we, we have in, in, in the tradition of uh, philosophy of technology, uh, we have people, both senior people and others. And I, I, I think uh, there, there's um, more and more interest in, in this topic. And I, I tried from my side to, to, to help to push this topic, basically. Thank you. Then we will uh, finish also on, on one question. Um, about the tension, I think, and uh, between dynamics of power. So you state several times in your book and extensively that um, AI can also enable people and provide power, uh, but also AI uh, in a traditional uh, opposite will also take away power from people because it is used as a political tool uh, to uh, to use power over over people so how do you reconcile these two aspects uh, the fact that it can enable people while it also can be used against these same people and i think your book provides great um i think light ways of looking at it but maybe to close with this question can you give us your view on that mm -hmm. yeah so um an answer that's often given to the question is, is, oh, it just depends how you use it. But I think that's, that's wrong in the sense that there are these tendencies in AI. And I think the tendencies, for example, facial recognition, um, clearly the way it's connected now with other things and the way it's developed, it, it, it supports more centralist and top-down uh, disciplining of, of people. Um, but I think we can... Um, as citizens, as uh, also tech people and so on, we, we can uh, change the technology and um, we can design it in such a way that, that it can, yeah, that it becomes more democratic. Um, so it, it's not a determinism where we, we, we can, we can uh, turn things around. 
Um, and as I see many um, yeah, good tendencies in that direction, um, because the, the idea would be that, that it's not just, um, that we're not just doing resistance, but that we, that we basically change the technology itself so that, um, that these tendencies get, get less uh, pronounced. Um, or, or disappear. So I, yeah, I think that's a bit the direction to go. But of course, there's still a lot of work to to then figure out what exactly does it mean uh, in particular contexts. Um, I just see that that yeah, now policy, for example, with um, facial recognition technologies, yeah, it's still there's unfortunately still a lot of opportunities to use it in a, in a way that's that's problematic. And um, yeah, I, I think to do something about it takes political action, but also takes action on the part of those who develop the technology and citizens who can push politics to enable that to, to, to try to, to de develop the different technologies. Um, and it's especially important, like now towards the future, there will be always new technologies, right? I mean, we didn't see the internet coming and uh, we didn't see this wide use of AI coming, so I think there will be new technologies and um, I think it's good to already from the beginning um, that also we as citizens are aware that, that we better try to take influence there on how the technology is shaped because otherwise it, it might be uh, very difficult after a while to turn things around and we see that with the internet for example there were a lot of hopes first that it would lead to more democracy but there's now also a lot of tendencies in the other direction and um, these are all in the technology, and I think we can, uh, you know, partly there are in the technology, and we, we can try to do something about it. But it's now very difficult. Um, I think with new, new technologies, we have that chance to um, uh, not only resist but also just change the technologies for the better. Okay. Uh, on these last words, I wish to thank you. Uh, very warmly, Mark. Uh, thank you to all the attendees. Uh, I'm putting again the link for the book uh, of Mark, The Political Philosophy of AI. Um, and uh, thank you very much. I wish you a great end of the European AI Week. And I'm looking forward to talking with some of you. And don't hesitate to go buy the book of Mark. Have a great day.